Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to today's LNG to Power Forum for North America, organised by Petroleum mm -hmm. Economist. Um, a quick reminder, by the way, before, we, before I describe the next session, that um, it, you ought to be possible to press the yeah, chat sorry. button on your screen, which opens up a chat function on the right hand side so that you can pose questions to the speakers. Now, the subject of this next panel is a particularly interesting one. It, it, it uh, follows on very neatly from the, um, from the previous session and also from the remarks I made uh, earlier at the, at the opening of the forum, uh, where I suggested that most primary energy sources can be categorized quite clearly as heroes or villains uh, in the energy transition. For example, coal, clearly a villain, and many countries have decided to leave it behind. Uh, renewables, uh, no carbon emissions in operation, so clearly a hero. For gas, the question is not nearly so simple because people, div experts divide on what the role of gas should be as we decarbonize. So I'm fascinated to see uh, what, the, uh, what the discussion in this panel, where, where the discussions in this panel lead to. Uh, our moderator for this panel is someone I met a very long time ago, actually, Ira Joseph, <laughs> who's now head of global gas and power analytics at S&P Global Platts. So, Ira, if you'd like to introduce your panelists and take it away, over to you. Ah, uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Alex, and thanks for having us here. We do appreciate it. Um, the uh, yes, I'd like to uh, to welcome today our, our panelists, David Goldwyn, uh, Emma Richards. And John Charles. Okay, well, let's get this going because we definitely have a lot to talk about. And as Alex talked about, um, we, uh, you know, gas is is both in the sort of protagonist and antagonist role when we talk about sort of the, the evolution of the market. And when we talk about decarbonization and, and the transition, the thing I always like to say about gas is that with gas, the the um, the bridge is getting uh, shorter and narrower over time here as we go. Uh, because, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you know, gas was going to account for a vast majority, particularly in power generation of all growth and power generation. And yet it keeps getting chipped away at over time. Every time we do another long-term run of our model, uh, the growth of gas, which we still have growing, of course, continues to get chipped away over time. And so as part of the transition, uh, again, with the transition uh, speeding up, slowing down, depending on, 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 you know, what part of the world you're in, uh, it, it comes. It comes to a lot of these issues that that deal with policy, which you know David can certainly primarily talk about, and you know Emma can talk. We'll talk about the market, and Jean Charles will talk about it from a company perspective uh, as well. And and so it, it does put it puts gas in this particularly tricky role, and LNG within that role is particular because as we were setting up for this meeting, I I started that with the premise is that you have LNG being the most expensive form of gas supply, trying to compete. In, a, in the most price sensitive form of gas demand. So instead of a world where you were seeking out security of supply, now you're seeking out security of demand. So I wanted to start off with John Charles here because of his obviously being in the most commercial aspect of this job uh, uh, among all of us. How, how do you sort of marry this issue of LNG just being from a cost perspective, at least within gas itself, you know, very, very expensive and yet trying to target this area where you know, the predators are at the gate, you know, in terms of competition, uh, particularly in terms of, of, of power generation and sort of marrying these two ideas together about the limitations of what we can do with LNG in terms of cost, but yet having to get it down to a price where it can compete with coal, it can compete with renewables and compete with storage. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ara. So I think uh, you have to see that from two perspectives. So first, the state of the market where you want to sell your energy and your LNG and the competitiveness of the LNG that you're selling. Mm -hmm. While being mindful to be as carbon neutral as possible, that's also very important. So if you see the market first, and I will take the, the Far East and the Southeast Asia as an example, because that's where the demand for LNG will mainly come from. Mm -hmm. There is a big push in Korea, India and China to switch from coal fired power station to gas fired power station. And the demand for LNG will be, I think, quite big to switch from coal to gas. The, the number speaks for themselves, actually, while preparing this, I uh, was, uh, was digging into a bit of the numbers. So for instance, China has today 2000 gigawatt of installed capacity, which is much more than the US before it was less, now it's more, obviously. So from these 2000 gigawatts, nearly 65% of the electricity produced is from coal, for only 3.5% from natural gas. 
The other sources are hydro is 17%, nuclear 5%, wind, solar, and biomass 10%. So you see that coal is the main energy used to produce electricity. So if China has a policy to switch from coal to less or no CO2 emitting electricity production, then I think that there is room for everyone, every, every one aspect of the industry, be it renewables, be, be, be being gas, being hydro, to have a place in this market. So that's one. So you, you compete, but at least, actually the market is so huge that you can compete. Yes. The second, the second really is to have a competitive energy, as you say. And to do that, we have to comply with two requirements, I think, is to have the best price, of course, and to take the necessary measures to meet our net zero carbon neutral society target by 2050, the one that total has, right? It's, 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 you, cannot, you cannot have one and not the other. So for the first part, to be competitive, at the time, uh, our strategy is to target around $500 uh, dollar per ton liquefaction project with huge low cost resource base like Arctic 2, like Mozambique, proxy proximity sorry, to markets like Mozambique, like Costa Azul, like PNG, also brownfield developments like Cameron, like ECA. We have to promote competition. We have to avoid, uh, you know, EPC single sourcing. And also we have to be customer centric. We have to offer flexibility, uh, shorter terms, bunkering, uh, LNG should be actually a tailor-made commodity. So even if it's slightly maybe uh, more expensive than the other sources of energy, you offer a tailor-made commodity. For the second part, to meet our net zero target, I think it is better to be an integrated player as we are than not, so that we can control our emissions along the value chain. And that's what we do, for instance, uh, here in the US at Cameron, where we, we instigated and are developing initiatives to reduce the carbon footprints of the, of the plant, mainly by two means, by the carbon capture technology, obviously, but also by solarizing the electricity production. So now we are in Louisiana and Cameron, but so the electricity coming from the monopoly energy, still we can put some solar panels on our plants, not for the 100% of the energy, of course, but for let's say 15%. We could do that to, to make that greener. We're also investing, um, um, sorry, in a, on a broader scale, we're also investing in, in renewables, in biogas, in hydrogen, offsetting tools, carbon credits, developing uh, other carbon technologies like northern lights or creating carbon sinks like reforestations. So it is only, I think, if you combine both the pricing aspects and the carbon reduction aspects that you'll be competitive. Because at the end of the day, both are crucial not only for the customers and the society in general, but also for us as a company, because we are really aiming to be the responsible energy player, providing energy that is affordable, reliable, and cleaner. That, that's our goal. And I think you can be competitive by combining all these aspects. So it sounds like, you know, really then competitively though, you're really focused on coal is really the opportunity out there. I know there's underlying organic growth for energy, as you said, in China, but it's really sort of attacking the coal issue and particularly in Asia, but, but or mainly, but, but elsewhere as well is really the area. And, and so I wanted to switch this to you, David, to talk this about from the, from the policy side, because when we look at carbon neutrality, particularly in the US, I mean, it, I was just thinking the other day, it's kind of hard you, who was better or worse for gas in terms of Trump versus, uh, Obama, because while the gas business was deregulated more and a lot of regulations were taken off, it did lead to a lot more flaring. It did lead to a lot more sort of focus on the potential problems uh, that gas brings to, to the decarbonization issue. And so I, where's sort of sort of the happy medium here between, bet, between you know, I guess, you know, what, what happened? We had, you know, all time record growth in, during a presidency during the Obama administration of oil and gas production. But then we had more deregulation within the, the, the Trump administration. Like, where, where do we fit here going forward with the Biden administration? It's a great question, Ira. Thanks, thanks for having me, uh, petroleum economist, and good to be on with these colleagues. Um, I think, the, uh, I think you've, you've kind of hit on it. In the Obama years, um, uh, they took a, a soft touch on, on the regulation. Um, and of course, uh, gas was a huge hero uh, in backing out coal and reducing US emissions, and still continues to play an important role. It also plays a role in uh, in supporting renewables and allowing renewable ex expansion, as we've as we've seen in California and other places when gas goes out. But I think the Trump administration really hurt the gas business in two ways. One was trade, 
obviously where antagonizing the major buyers is not always a good commercial strategy for domestic players. Um, mm -hmm. And the other is um, it, it, by essentially enabling the industry to give itself a black eye with all this flaring. So I think where the, uh, the Biden administration is gonna go is to use every tool that it can to do methane regulation and control flaring. Now those tools are clumsy. Uh, a second round of clean power plan will be hard to put out. EPA will have to stretch its use of the Clean Air Act. They'll be using FERC you know, to deny some, some permits. But I think the, the potential partnership between the industry and the Biden administration is to do the kind of thing that Total has talked about. It's gonna be carbon scoring measuring the value chain and trying to get those numbers down to distinguish the good players from the bad players. Because as we saw with, you know, with France and with Nextera that, you know, the, um, you know, they tend to judge the country, not the company at this point. Mm -hmm. So the lower, the weak players are dragging everyone down. So I think there may be a, a possibility for some sort of voluntary metric uh, carbon scoring, but I think it's possible that if there isn't support from industry and if there's resistance in Congress, you know, people might think about things like um, the next time you have to grant an LNG export permit, it may only be in the national interest to grant that permit to companies that are compliant with some sort of energy intensity scale. And I haven't heard this, I don't speak for, you know, uh, of the Biden transition team or anyone else, but I think those kinds of tools are, are going to be important for competitive reasons, but also to enable, uh, at least on a domestic basis, for a Biden administration to be able to tolerate the, the industry. And I think, um, I think that's the win-win, good for the industry, good for production. Uh, and if you want, we can talk about how, what, how this will work on the international side. But I think domestically, um, that will make the US LNG industry sustainable. And that is good for it, uh, whether the Texas Railroad Commission you know, knows it or not. Yeah, I think sort of this, this, this is where it gets tricky, particularly for the US. And I'm sure, Jean-Charles, this is a, a terrible, tricky thing for, your, for, for what you do is that, we have these non-integrated LNG projects, meaning that you're, you're basically buying gas from somebody else, somebody else is transporting it to the liquefaction plant, and then you're exporting it. And having to account for, 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 for you know, carbon neutrality, or at least the eventual goal of carbon neutrality along that whole area there, it does have to drive up costs, doesn't it? Or, 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 or am I sort of missing the point on that? No, I think you're right. I mean, the, the problem we have in the US, um, is, is twofold if you want. First, as you say, we buy the gas in the market. So we cannot control mm -hmm. what the producers of gas are doing. Uh, what is show is that uh, if we can have leverage on them uh, to, to reduce the, the, see the carbon emissions, the methane emission, we'll do whatever we take to do that because that's our goal too. Concerning the second aspect of your questions, at the plant itself, mm -hmm. yes, of course, uh, our, our, our plant at Cameron, for instance, is, 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 is um, the electricity is, is from energy, but, but we have gas turbines. So we have a double problem. So that when, when the gas arrives, it, it, it emits carbon and for the turbines, it produce carbon. So we have to do, uh, it's extra cost, of course. But in the meantime, as for, the, uh, as for all the technologies, you know, um, the, the cost will reduce uh, the more you implement uh, cost reduction, uh, carbon reduction uh, kind of technology, the, the, the lesser your cost. So we are improving. I think R&D is very, and innovation are very important. And we saw that also in the renewables. Uh, if you remember all these wind power, these solar power panels, all that was very expensive like 10, 20 years ago, very expensive. And now it's, it's nothing. I, I'm not saying that carbon capture would be nothing because it, it requires massive investments, but you can do a lot of carbon reduction and a lot of methane control uh, emissions, a lot of them by, by technology that doesn't cost too much uh, mm -hmm. to, to detect the leaks uh, and, to, um, and to, uh, to avoid venting, to avoid flaring. All these things can be done at the low cost. Of course, some of the costs associated with uh, you know, CapEx and stuff like that, we have to take into account, but I think it is also to, to respond to the, to the end customer who wants that. So, uh, and also that's where you are, like, like, you know, some countries, like, especially in Europe, they want to be green, but when you raise the, the tax on the diesel, then, the, then you have the yellow vest. So you have to, yeah. you have to deal with that. And, and it's not easy. And we have, to find, we have to find the right balance to be, to be responsible for the future generation. So, and that involves some costs, definitely. Yeah. So, so Emma, just to turn to you, when I get back to my metaphor that the uh, road for or the bridge for gas is getting shorter and narrower, I mean, do you do you agree with that sentiment first of all, or or like do you have a different view? I mean, I know obviously the companies are, who are producing the LNG or, or the gas are going to be more bullish, 
et cetera. But like, where do you sort of sit in terms of the, of the long-term prospects for gas, you know, not just as part of the transition, but as part of sort of, as part of the fuel mix going forward? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think I would broadly agree with what you're saying. I think you know, previously um, there was pretty strong conviction that gas would have a more lasting role in the energy mix because it was taken mm-hmm. or it was presented as a low carbon alternative. And I think that's because it was being compared to you know oil and coal and in displacing those, it does yield significant emissions reductions. But increasingly that frame of reference is shifting. And I think as you know, environmental policy and regulation continues to tighten and as countries push more aggressively for their kind of net zero 2050 type targets, um, the role for gas is brought more into question because it's being pit against um, net zero fuel alternatives. Um, and it has to go a ways into proving how it can fit within that energy mix. Um, but that being said, I think whether or not you see coal have, um, gas having a kind of sustainable role to play, I think it varies hugely depending on you know what market you're looking at and what subsector within that and of course always you would want to look at all the available alternatives and try to select the one that yielded the biggest emission reductions but you know in many markets and in many sectors um, there are applications that can't be met either technically or commercially with net zero alternative fuels and in, in those cases um, natural gas is your best option um, so I do see a continuing role for it but I think once you have acknowledged that and once you do see a more sustained role for gas in the energy mix, perhaps that then raises questions of why more efforts aren't being made to try and decarbonize that gas, you know, through shifts of maybe hydrogen or other biogas, biomethane, or through the deployment of CCUS, something like that to try and uh, reduce the net emissions effects of the sustained role for, for gas. When you, now, so when you, when, I'm sorry, when you look at that on a company sort of level, like, which, which companies do you see sort of best position to, 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 to take on that transition better? I mean, is this just a game that the majors are gonna play and the national oil companies? Or is there sort of, you know, like in the, in the era of shale, is there more sort of a startup transition sort of way in which, in which com- there, there are sort of gonna be more niche companies that can handle this kind of thing? I think at the moment, what we are seeing is it's mainly the majors that are kind of leading the way in this regard. Um, I mean, the, the variety of responses has been absolutely huge. And, you know, at the top end, you do have companies that are being really proactive in shifting their strategies, aligning with the Paris Agreement, so on and so forth. And the other end, you have companies that are basically not even acknowledging climate risk as any kind of threat to their business. Right. Um, but in terms of the, um, even once they recognize the risk is there, in terms of the capability to actually kind of reorient the business to adapt to that, I think it will be limited in the number of companies that can do that effectively. Um, I think looking for kind of your existing asset base and potential synergies with renewables, you know, conversion of refining capacity, um, utilizing your gas infrastructure mm-hmm. and distribution networks, links with e-mobility and refueling, that kind of thing. I think on an individual company by company level, there will be opportunities across <laughs> the spectrum from the majors and the NOCs to some smaller players, um, but it will depend on a lot on kind of what your asset base is and where those synergies lie and how proactive you are in, in kind of moving towards that. And even then the kind of financial and institutional demands are pretty pretty significant. So I don't think it's going to be realistically an option for a lot of the companies in the sector. Right. So speaking of institutional demands, uh, to back to you, David, as I said in the beginning, we're, we've, we've gone from a world where Security of a supply was an issue, which is basically how the whole LNG business started, to an issue of security of demand. And every month now, you know, when I when I see sort of how gas is evolving and its growth is evolving, it used to be that basically the supply side was getting attacked, anti-fracking, and even midstream get going after pipelines. But now it seems like the demand side is really sort of picking up pace in terms of where there's sort of uh, competitive threats, either from policy, from shareholder movements, from uh, ESG issues. I mean, you, I think you mentioned before the NG issue, the CNUC ban, uh, the Nord Stream 2 politics. I mean, there's a lot sort of going on here and it and it, and it's starting to attack the demand side a little more. And I was wondering if you could sort of like talk about that, not just at the federal level, but when we see major cities on a population weighted basis that consume a huge amount of gas demand, and if we don't have growth in those, those cities, then what happens? 
Domestically, I think it's a, it's a serious issue. Yeah, we've got five or six jurisdictions which have domestic gas bans, and we now have five, five or six states that are actually passing laws saying that jurisdictions can't um, have gas bans. So there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a litigation or a legislation battle going on. Um, but I think domestically, that secular trend towards you know reducing gas consumption and increasing renewables mm -hmm. you know, is probably uh, unstoppable. And I think whatever you see in terms of state incentives, which will now have free reign under uh, under a Biden administration and encouragement for state incentives, may continue that. Um, and I think uh, you know, I think until you have a national policy like a carbon price mm -hmm. um, or a national clean energy standard that gives credible assurance that, you know, at least in the US, that the country is going to deal with its carbon emissions, then all of these second and third best options are going to remain, you know, top of the agenda. And, you know, if, you know, if the Democrats had a, the energy efficiency and clean energy standard, you'd be in a position to say, we don't actually need to be banning gas stoves, you know, mm -hmm. or gas and places like that, because we're going to meet that standard some other way. So I think it's, you know, domestically, it's not going to change. Internationally, it's a little bit of a different story. And here, I think, um, you know, the policy will really matter and uh, a Biden administration policy is going to matter because there's a, a tremendous amount of magical thinking going on about the pathway for decarbonization in Asia, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in Southeast Asia, um, and the importance of um, assuring the reliability of renewables by providing gas back up, which is what we're seeing in Brazil uh, and Argentina and to some extent in Colombia. And as long as people think that the goal is zero hydrocarbons as opposed to zero emissions, um, then they're going to misread those markets. And I think the ability to raise expectations on Paris will be in serious trouble because it's going to run across the economic development and energy poverty concerns of, of those countries. And so this is an open question for the Biden administration in terms of its policy, which is will it respect the theology of the Paris Agreement, which is that every country carts it, charts its own course under its nationally determined commitment where gas plays a role and therefore it will encourage low carbon LNG exports to meet that demand or will it take an ideological approach and sort of pretend that that demand isn't there mm -hmm. and see coal continue to rise in these other places. So domestically, not a whole lot I think we can do about it. Internationally, this is a, a battle within the administration yet to be fought. Jean-Charles, is this a concern for you? I mean, I know because you're French, I'm going to ask you about the EU, but just in general, is, is this sort of like ban of new gas connections and new growth if you were to take out Paris and Berlin and London and just, and not even make it a national policy, but just make it a city policy in major cities around the world? Is this is this something that you're, you're concerned about or that that you look at that ever when, you, when, you're, when you're planning? Yes, of course. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we, we try to, to transform ourselves into, into an energy mix company. That's why we, we, we were branding ourselves in Total Energies. I mean, Europe is not the US, it's not uh, the emerging countries. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in Europe, uh, the renewables are, are getting a, a good pace of development. I think it's one third of the production in Europe now, more in the Nordic countries than in the South, and uh, you have you know, local differences. But, uh, and then we're investing massively in, in renewables at the time. I mean, it, uh, the renewables will be a, a big part of our, of our portfolio in the future. It doesn't mean that the, the, the gas will not have a place because again, you know, I don't think the technology is ready. The, the BSW uh, revolution is not there yet. We, we can have wind, we can have solar, but the, the battery storage, the storage is still not there yet. It's still expensive. So uh, as long as you don't have the battery backing up what <laughs> the solar, and the wind are producing, then you need an alternative energy which can produce ele electricity on a, re on, a, on a very regular basis. And so, of course, all that is part of the, of, of the energy mix that we want to, uh, to develop and, and, um, and, and, and to have greener energy. But we're also focusing on, on the markets to come back with what David is saying. In emerging countries, I think LNG is, is, is one of the answers to, to meet the, the local demands because they, still, they, 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 they are trying to switch from coal to, to gas, which is difficult for them because they're in infrastructures. And I think, I think gas could, could really meet their demands and, and maybe in a later stage to come to a, to a net zero uh, a kind of uh, uh, status, but that will take more time, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Emma. Um, I know we focused a lot here on pushing gas into power generation because of the electrification of, let's say, everything. 
But is there is there are there any other markets you potentially see you know for gas itself to be consumed as gas itself that isn't involving electrification? I mean, I, I, I'm curious how bullish you are in either gas as a transport fuel, gas and bunkering, uh, and even gas gas and industry. I, I know I know certainly from my own work. If we're having trouble having gas demand growth in a country like the U.S., where it's two dollars and fifty cents forever, like when you have to slap on the additional cost of taking it to somewhere else, it really kind of like it, competitively it, it makes it a much more difficult fit for me in, in terms of growth. So I was wondering if you were focused on those areas. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Affordability is the, the massive issue for this, and then in a lot of those gas importing countries, you do need some measure of policy support in order the gas to compete with some of the other fuels in some sectors. Um, in terms of where there are opportunities for growth outside the power sector, um, I, I would be relatively bullish on the prospects on the industrial side. Again, it will depend on the market and the policy and the regulation and how that evolves. Um, but I think there are you know, industrial applications for which there aren't very viable zero emissions alternatives and where the reliance mm -hmm. at the moment is pretty heavily on coal and oil. And so I think in, in kind of those applications, there's kind of pretty decent scope for gas to take greater ground. Again, like you said, the cost is a concern, but assuming that policy moves in the direction that it's currently traveling, then I think the opportunities on the industrial side will grow. For transport, um, yeah, I certainly see opportunities for growth, but I think Realistically, it's going to remain quite limited, and I think mainly in that side, it's it's on the kind of infrastructural constraints, mm -hmm. and there will be markets where the governments are good at kind of putting the necessary infrastructure in place. Um, but in most cases, I think it will be limited, and and probably stay pretty much constrained to, you know, buses and long haul trucks and dedicated shipping and freight routes that where you can kind of manage those infrastructure and refueling concerns. But in terms of kind of wider deployment, I think. Realistically, yeah, it's, it's going to be a very kind of limited market going forward. Right. So, so for Jean Charles, then this this is like the, the question then becomes twofold. Obviously, the eight dollar JKM we have today is not going to be happening forever, and the two dollar JKM we had this summer isn't going to be happening forever. So, there's some sweet spot here, obviously, for for you to grow on a you know that can get you the kind of return in order for you to obviously build out your your LNG capacity and sell the LNG but then it's also an issue of as i said security of demand and in my in my view it's it, I, I call it buying demand or integration it's like how how far downstream are you willing to go here in order to sort of secure that demand for yourself uh, and and where kind of is your sort of sweet spot for gas prices? Obviously, I know you want gas prices to be as high as possible and demand to grow as much as possible. But realistically, are, are we in a four to six dollar world in Asia? Is it five to seven? Is it six to eight? Like where where sort of do do you see realistically see the market in terms of that transition, and how does that affect your investment decisions? Yeah, so I, I will I will try to answer on the on the first part the demand side. So I think you know mm -hmm. uh, when we when we send our gas to our re gas recyclation in in, uh, in France, it's kind of easy because we own the access right, so we just dump it. Sure. So for for Asia, you can mm -hmm. you can sell your LNG to Chinese buyers or Japanese or Korean buyers. Then you unload at the uh, at the terminal. So all these markets are very mature. We know the prices, and the prices will be what they will be. All right. For so so what you're trying to do is to is to uh, kind of do a, a little push, and to be even more integrated downstream. To 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 in some in some countries to try even to sell the molecules you know the the the, the electron the, the electrons sorry not the molecules the electrons, but what we did for instance a good example is what we are doing for in India with uh, with Adani and India again is a country where the coal to gas switch would be around fifteen percent of the, the, the energy, and so it's a country with lots of potential very tricky very difficult as we know, but but then we we partner the only way to get access to downstream market is to have a partner a reliable partner that will give you. Um, uh, access to its own markets. And that's what we did with Adani. Adani is the, uh, the country's largest infrastructure conglomerate. And so uh, uh, to do that, um, we have, they have to meet uh, the growing demand of gas. Have, we have to develop with them a broad energy offering for the dusty markets. And so the cooperation agreement we have with them includes the, the import of LNG, the regasification of LNG and the sale with them to industrial and commercial customers as well as distribution of natural gas to customers. We are building pipelines with them. We are sharing the risks. So it is very important because otherwise, uh, how to access the, the Indian market is very difficult. So we are also mm -hmm. focusing on, on expanding the, the Damra energy gas terminal on the Eastern seaboard with them. 
Another example is, is Benin, where we try to put an FSIU uh, to, to get access to, to, to the country, to, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to provide feed gas to uh, the power stations. So another one is, for instance, in the south, we're developing, you know, you were developing these massive projects in the north of Mozambique, but in the south, there is a, a project a little bit uh, uh, more little, which is to import, actually, LNG to, to feed the pipelines to go to South Africa for power stations. So mm. it's, that's the only way. So, and then, then your, soft, your, 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 your pricing you're talking about, it's not it's not JKM. It's, it's it's a price you do with your with your partners. So it depends of actually how, how deep downstream you go, right? Yes. And then you have all this sharing of the risks and the rewards, and, and and it's it's not a spot it's not a spot price. It is a price which is being part of a bigger um, a bigger model, if you want. So I, I cannot say today what is the spot price for that because it's too it's too complex. I yeah, I, 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 yeah, David. I was just in terms of this because. Like Jean Charles now ha is is worried about the entire value chain, like in, yes. in terms of his investments. If you were to have to go to him in terms of what is, you know, from a policy perspective, what's most what's most vulnerable on the value chain and what's what's most positive on the value chain, like where where would you where, where would you have sort of Jean Charles focus when when he was looking as that as a, as as the company, like where 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 is gas most vulnerable and where is gas sort of most promising, I guess, for the lack of a better word. Well, I would say, um, yes, I was thinking the, uh, that the model that Jean-Charles has described uh, is probably going to be um, the only viable model for advancing decarbonization in a lot of the developing world. Because right. if you think about the, the areas that are most ripe, sub-Saharan Africa, where you have you know, basically a lot of biomass, a huge number of unserved, uh, a large unserved population, um, you know, more in India, there's lots more to do in India and China, um, but even the Caribbean and Central America. You have a lot of countries that either have high debt, um, their economy these are in bad shape, they're not in a position to borrow, or they don't have the administrative capacity to build the infrastructure. We've been trying to consume flared gas in Nigeria for 30 years, you know, and it just seems to be an impossible mission. Right. So um, I think those are the areas where you can have significant decarbonization advances um, in the power sector, either for baseload, uh, which I think will be a, a part of the issue, particularly in the big cities in in the big coastal cities in, um, in Af Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but also on a smaller scale, um, you know, you're gonna need the backup for hydro, which is affected by climate change in Brazil and Argentina and Colombia and Chile and other places where it may be seasonal, but gas is the way that they are going to sustain the reliability of renewables and not mm -hmm. give renewables a bad name because they have significant periods where the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine as we saw for extended periods in California. So I think most of the developing world, you know, is a place where there is huge opportunity for gas, as well as, you know, China and Korea and Taiwan, as Jean-Charles has mentioned, trying to further decarbonize their industrialized economy, but needing to deal with both price and reliability. So I think that's where the opportunity is. But you know, where I could have, would have wished that the Green Climate Fund or the World Bank would be able to make transmission loans, you know, and pipeline loans to be able to build, you know, HVDC networks, you know, there's just not going to be enough money. And so the commercial model, you know, partnerships between companies and, you know, and industrial users, aluminum manufacturers in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, baseload manufacturing in, in, in China, that's the way to go. I don't know if there are enough companies to do it. Um, but in terms of what are you going to get in the next 10 years until there's a step technology step change, I, I think that's where you need to do it. And I think that's probably how you need to do it. So based on what David said, Emma, would you, would you say when you're, when you're analyzing the market that, that it's, it's more important, and obviously they're both important to look at the commercial or, or the, or the policy aspects of what we're talking in here. Cause it seems like, you know, gas is really sort of that all of these policy issues that David is talking about here and all these policy issues that John Charles is confronting seems to be a, a bigger part of the discussion with the gas than ever before. And it's not just simply, can I get in at coal parity or coal parity plus carbon, that there are these other sort of extraneous issues in there. Like, how would you sort of weighting how you look at these things when we, when we talk about transition? Yeah, I think, I think policy uncertainties have become an increasingly important factor in this. I mean, obviously they're investing in very long lived assets and it's always hard to know what the market's gonna do 10, 20 years down the line. But um, I think with the ongoing energy transition, 
the policy uncertainty, as I said, has risen to such a degree and <clears throat> can have potentially such far reaching impacts on future demand outlooks and the economic viability of projects that um, I would say that's sort of become an increasingly dominating factor in how we look at the, the market outlook and the prospects for, for both demand and supply for, for natural gas. Okay, great. Uh, I, we have a bit of a technological glitch where I can't see the chat room, but so I'm going to ask the panelists if they see any questions on there that they'd uh, they'd like to answer. Uh, if, if there aren't any, we can keep talking, but I wanted to make sure that we, we, we address the audience to see if there's any questions out there. Do we have any questions? A couple of comments, but no questions. Okay. Okay. So... Uh, so a couple of uh, uh, quick hitters here before before we tune out. Uh, David, real uh, well, Emma and David, but David, uh, Nord Stream two, uh, is this gonna is this gonna die at the finish line here, or is it actually gonna get built? I think eventually it's going to get built, um, but <laughs> I think there will be a few more roadblocks uh, thrown in. Congress has a new bill trying to to get in the way of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's, uh, if I were in government, there's a, a fair amount I'd be willing to trade for Nord Stream 2 if I was able to get real reassurance for Europeans on dealing with some of the com competition issues and things that would more effectively constrain Russia's market power. But mm -hmm. um, nobody asked me. So, uh, so I, don't know <laughs> I think, uh, I think um, so much of it has been built and the governments are so intent on it that I think it's, uh, I think it's inevitable. Okay, Emma? Yeah, Any views? It's, no, I would agree with what David said. I think it's not entirely past the point of no return, but it's so much of it invested, has been invested in it that I think it's unlikely that it kind of completely collapses at this at this stage. Famous last words. Jean Charles, I'm not going to ask you to answer that question, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. but I, what I would like to ask you though is is that you know that we at least in what I do, I've always had the presumption that it was easier for a pipeline gas to compete versus LNG, uh, and 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 sort of. There was the pipeline gas first, and then the LNG came in when you didn't have the pipeline gas. But what we saw in 2020, particularly in the Chinese market, is that is that the pipeline gas was actually backed out in favor of the LNG in a lot of cases. I mean, do you see, uh, you know, any, you know, from from that perspective, sort of equal weighting between LNG and pipeline gas in the future, or are they still sort of two separate and distinct things that both make up the gas market? It depends. Again, it depends on the markets. I mean, pipeline gas has always existed into in, in Europe and was was the main the main way of you know of, of putting the gas in, a, in in your in your house. So LNG is new. I mean, we had so, several terminals. It's not new like in in Spain in in, in Spain or, or France or Belgium, even the UK, but mm -hmm. it's it's a small portion. I mean, it is it's it's uh, it will increase, but it's still a small portion. In in China, I mean. The, the, the gas demand is really on the coastal areas and the gas is coming from, from Russia, from the north. So, I mean, you have to build thousands of miles of pipeline to, to get the gas where it has to be. So it's, they need the gas there. I think it's a good, comp uh, it's complementary to the LNG. They will coexist, but uh, I think the LNG will have a bigger role in China than the pipeline gas. That's my personal view. Whereas in Europe, I think uh, we will we'll be depending on um, less and less, I guess, huh, if we go to the Green Deal. Because the Green Deal applies not only to the U.S. and the dirty gas, as they call it, but uh, that also will apply to, to, to the Russian gas somehow. So I guess we'll go more into renewables, but pipeline and, and definitely energy will, will uh, continue to coexist for sure. Hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, so I think we're coming up to the end, end of our time here. Does anybody have any, any final comments or, or things that I maybe missed in terms of... Uh, energy transition here that, that we want to talk about. We didn't talk about uh, storage, you know, at all. And something I like to say always is that renewable battery, uh, sorry, gas is not competing with renewables. It's actually competing with storage to work in harmonization with renewables. And I think, I, I think that's still true. <laughs> uh, but is there anything on, on the storage side or, or the storage side for gas versus hydrogen, uh, you know, that anybody, you know, has any, any thoughts on here and whether the hydrogen thing is in the previous panels, you know, there was some allusion to the fact that we're definitely in a, in a sort of bubble here, you know, on day one. And, you know, what does this settle into, into what the actual hydrogen market looks like? I just, just some, any, any, if anybody has any sort of last comments on those, on, on, on those issues, storage and hydrogen in particular. Well, I would just say, I mean, it, I, I think hydrogen will be a, a niche player for things, the, the things that Emma was talking about, you know, high temperature heat, um, heavy duty trucks and things like that. Hydrogen, you know, will be an important player, but um, until those costs come down dramatically, then 
then it's kind of hard to seeing it being, you know, the, the widespread fuel. So it will have a role, just not, maybe not uh, what all the hype suggests. But that um, gas is storage, that's really the issue in places where gas is the balancer. If there was mm -hmm. low cost, large scale storage, you wouldn't need gas, uh, but you don't. Um, and it doesn't seem to be on the horizon until you do. That's the role that gas is gonna play, you know, as the, as the backup, you know, for hydro or the backup for renewables. Um, and I don't see that problem going away soon. Okay. Um, so I, I like to do outros instead of intros. So I do want to thank uh, David Goldwyn, who's head of uh, Goldwyn, president of Goldwyn uh, Global Strategies, Emma Richards, who's a senior oil and gas analyst for Fitch Solutions, and John Charles, I'm scared to pr try to pronounce your last name, I'm sorry, uh, who is the head of liquefaction for Total. And I, I want to thank all the panelists here uh, for meeting, uh, meeting us, uh, uh, meeting up and, and, and having this event. And uh, we look forward to the next event after this. Thank you. Thanks much. Thank you, Aaron.